Hello, welcome to the BDR.net lunch gathering videos. We get together every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern and we cover a wide range of topics. So we invite you to enjoy this one and come visit us any Thursday that's convenient. We're at www.thebdr.net. That's the BDR.net. And we'd be happy to show you the engineering articles, IT articles, history articles, things that you'll find of interest. So again, thank you for coming. Enjoy the video. Take care. Jeff Welton, he's back Hi. with us. Isn't that great? And uh, I do want to mention, Jeff has been doing Transmitter Tuesday for a year now, based out of his dungeon there, uh, <laughs> his man cave. What would we, what would we call it? Um, Dungeon's the word I use. Okay. Uh, let's see. I've got we got some background noise, so I think I better mute mics just in general. Uh, get, there, that's better. And please feel free to use your space bar or your alternate A uh, when uh, when you're going to talk. Um, Jeff's uh, Jeff's in his man cave, and uh, uh, he's uh, agreed to be with us again today and talk about things, not just Nautel, but transmitter site and and things that help us to to keep everything running smoothly. I, I know the first thing that I wrote down, Jeff, that uh, I wanted to remember. And that was the comment about torques and uh, having the right torque pressure. See, when you say torques, I think T-O-R-X, the little star-shaped screwdrivers. But yeah. Torque, yes, torque, okay. And so that's always been a big thing. Um, I'm going to interrupt you right in this, because if you uh, keep going, I'll forget about what I'm going to say, of course, because <laughs> the thing I've discovered once I passed 40, my memory is really good, but it's only this long. Um, every time you have two pieces of metal that join, especially in a situation where they're going to be heated and cooled, like turning a transmitter on, turning it off, summertime, wintertime, Unless they're identical pieces of metal, they're going to expand and contract at different rates. And so for uh, to give you an example, uh, we the old 50 kilowatts we used to build, the Amphet 50, I, I know I see a few guys on here that I know have worked on those before. And uh, those had these big honking uh, through like bolt-in diodes with a fly lead on them. Uh, QL08, QL09 are our part numbers. The fact that I can still remember that is really frightening. They were an IR300 AU. So it was a, a 300 amp diode. Anyway, those things were a nickel plated uh, copper and they were going into an aluminum heat sink. And the um, thermal coefficient of the two is different. So if you didn't follow the torque and you just went full Armstrong on uh, tightening those things down, as soon as the thing got up to temperature, it would shear the stud side of those diodes. And I mean, you haven't lived until you've heard what a one inch diode bolt sounds like when it's breaking in half in the middle of a transmitter. It's not a little tink. Um, and then thing, bad things happen in a really fast hurry. Uh, same token, I've seen a lot of folks using uh, stainless steel hardware in cast mica capacitors with the brass nipples in them. And if you don't torque those very carefully, either they'll get loose and start a nice little meltdown or they'll get tight, sure the pin and start a nice little meltdown. So definitely torque, uh, everything. I mean, when we're building a transmitter and I, I know the same is true with Rody because the, the Germans are incredibly detailed when it comes to stuff like this. Every screw has a specific torque setting. I mean, whether it's a cabinet screw and I mean, I'm sure Don can speak to it because I know he's been to the factory, but uh, yeah, every screw has, has a torque setting and uh, definitely you should try to follow that whenever you can. Don, care to share? Don, you're muted. Don, uh, alternate today will unmute you or spacebar. There, there you go. go. Uh, spacebar wasn't uh, working, and it should have been alternate A. That's a Alter window. alternate day. <laughs> I don't know if that works on my Mac, but yeah, no, <laughs> just right. The uh, 
well, precision in building these things, and I'm sure you know, and and you know, Peggy's COVID's the same kind of thing, where they know what torque they want it at, and they will set it the right way. And the best thing for you to do if you have to remove a screw is to reinstall it the same, not not over tighten it, and, and certainly not under tighten it. Yeah. Now, the, the big thing too for us is if it's really critical, like, uh, and again, a screw holding a MOSFET in uh, where you're going to see some pretty good heat and some different thermal expansions, uh, capacitors, uh, again, the, the big lug diodes and some of the older boxes, we'll, we'll give you the torque spec. I mean, the, uh, those diodes are 25 foot pounds, 300 inch pounds, and uh, I have no idea what that is in metric. Uh, my Newton meters have failed me. Where do you but, find that? Uh, where do I find what? The spec? Yep. Either it will, so we do it one of two ways. Either we publish it in the manual, like the troubleshooting guides for the current transmitters give you the torque spec for the MOSFETs in the manual itself, or we will um, provide an information sheet with the parts and it'll have the torque spec on it. And that, that would be for like, if you had to order it as an aftermarket part, like those diodes. The other option is, of course, you place the order and whoever takes the order say, don't forget, these need to be torqued to this level. But we try to put stuff like that in writing because, well, as I've proven repeatedly, memory is a fleeting thing. It can be. It can hey, Jeff, be. I got a question for you. It's, yeah. It's something I've always wondered about but never really cared enough to ask. Um, considering that different metals have uh, different properties, um, is conductivity ever different to the point where you need to use brass instead of copper or something like that? So it will vary and depends on the situation. Uh, in, if we're building a combiner, then we try to use pretty much all copper fittings and we'll use brass because it's about as close as you can get to copper for thermal expansion. Um, you won't, in like a high power AM combiner, you won't typically see a lot of stainless hardware. Now at the lower powers, 50 kilowatts and below, then yeah, we don't worry about it too much. But when you get up above 100 kilowatt, then uh, brass is, is the way to go. And but you're talking, same, about, yeah. you're talking about expansion. I'm talking about conductivity. Does it affect conductivity? Not significantly, no. I mean, the resistance, we're talking, you know, over what, a couple of square inches at the very most. So, I mean, your, your resistance per inch is fractions of an ohm. It's not going to be that critical, I wouldn't think. It's futile. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it is. But, uh, but no, I mean, that's typically not one of the design considerations. The thermal expansion is, is the much bigger and to some extent galvanic corrosion, depending on the environment. Like our navigational stuff, we use... Uh, we use the galvanic tables a lot when we're building stuff that's going to be stuck on an oil rig in the middle of the ocean. Okay. Let's, uh, let's widen ourselves out a little bit more toward the uh, concept of maintaining a site. And uh, again, we started this a little bit earlier, uh, had a few things. What is the first thing and anybody can chime in on this, but Jeff, what's the first thing you look at when you get to a site? So remembering that I typically see every site for the first time, it's, I mean, if I have to make a repeat visit, something's gone horribly wrong. So uh, my viewpoint will be a little bit different, but the very first thing I do every time, and I guess for, for my own site, I do the same thing, but the first thing I do is hook my little FLIR camera up to my phone and uh, take a picture of the uh, breaker panel. You know, I want to know if I'm a couple of days, hours, months, whatever, away from a fire before anything else. After that, then air filters are the next because it's uh, low hanging fruit and immediately obvious. Uh, for my site, we use a, uh, just a, a little belt driven fan to do some air exchange in the, in the room. I mean, where we're located, we typically don't get hot enough to need AC. So there's no point to it, especially at, at the altitude that site's at, but I'll look at the belt and make sure there's no squeaks or cracks or anything like that. And uh, after that, then I'll get into backup systems. Uh, well, and again, community station, we don't have a lot of backups. We just, uh, we, we do a lot of praying. I mean, you, nothing teaches your religion faster than having a radio station with no backups. 
I think one of the problems, of course, is how often someone gets to a transmitter site. Yep. The one that I was at yesterday, uh, that I'd mentioned 100 miles northwest of here, uh, had the last entry in a quasi-maintenance log was uh, September of last year. Mm -hmm. And there was no indication of when the generator was run or if it had been run. Uh, Any time in the last couple of years, there was no indication of literally anything uh, that was helpful. Yep, and that's something that is very site specific. I mean, for our particular site, we've got a little VS1 sitting in a rack with a uh, with a barracks box feeding it. As a rule, we go up there twice a year. Um, beyond that, if there's a problem or if we're doing scheduled upgrades, we'll go up there. But uh, yeah, I mean, for us, that works. For I've It's all your fault, by the way. Oh, yeah, sure it is. It's well, my- <laughs> the, whole idea, the whole idea of solid state transmitters has given owners and GMs the, the right to think that, well, you'd never have to go up to the transmitter site anymore. Well, why would you be out of the station for a day? So the analogy I always use, and I beat this drum a lot, is I've never met a station owner. Oh, there's there's probably some out there, but I haven't met one yet that didn't drive a fairly decent vehicle. (laughs) And I just look at them and say, do you uh, get the oil changed on your car? It's the same thing. The car's running. Why would you get the oil changed? Very good point. The the difference still brakes checked. It's still stopping, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> and the difference is transmitters, towers, transmitter sites generally live much harder lives because everything they do is not an hour a day. It's every second of every day. Yeah. You know, so, you look at antennas you pull down, you look at, at the paint on a tower, you don't think of it till you have the hardware on the ground and you realize this thing was dissolved by 20 years of weather. And we did a, uh, one of our, and the, I'm going to correct Barry a little bit. Uh, he, he mentioned Transmitter Tuesdays. Uh, I think the name marketing gave it was Transmission Talk Tuesday, but then they turned it over to me and I just basically make it whatever I happen to feel like talking about this month. Um, so the theme last month was all maintenance and engineering and mentoring. Uh, this month, I think the theme is more on technology and uh different types of uh, like STLs, uh, drone inspections. We're going to hit a little bit of everything. Um, Anyway, the the point I was getting to with that is that you really need to, in a lot of cases, really work to educate management on the importance of maintenance over putting the fire out. And that can be a challenge sometimes because why would you fix it if it ain't broken? Be perfectly honest, in 31 years of uh, doing uh, customer related uh, discussions, I get it a lot from y'all. You know, my transmitter's broke. Why would I, or not work? It's working. Why would I do that software update? Or uh, why would I? I've walked into a site and Barry keeps after me for the picture, and someday I'll go through the shoebox full of photos to find it. But I walked into a site in Winnipeg, Manitoba once. They had this nice little cardboard box there, about a foot long by nine inches wide. And in it, very neatly filed, was a Ziploc bag containing every single field mod we had sent them for 20 years. Uh, Exactly zero of them had been installed. They were all just neatly filed in this little cardboard box. You know, and uh, he goes, well, it's running. Why would I do those? And I I pick it up, and the very first line is, this affects the long-term reliability of this transmitter. And I mean, he says, well, 20 years, it's... It's like, yeah, well, do you want to get it to 40? <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's it's an ongoing challenge for sure. And it, it happens at all levels. Jeff, when I was at United Broadcasting, I used to have a sign on my office. And so I covered up engineering and I put it, it put up there the Ministry of Blame because <laughs> we were just in charge of blame all the time. Some days, whether you're laying it or receiving it one way or the other. Um, and uh, it, it is... Like I said, it's a challenge sometimes. And I think as I talk to some of the younger folks that are getting into this, I see it changing a little bit. So I'm optimistic for the future. I'll be long retired before it gets there. So it won't matter anyway to me, but uh, 
but uh, I am seeing it change where the younger folks are becoming more of the management structure, the management team. Well, as much as a lot of radio stations have a staff or a team left at all, but uh, you know they're they're able to um, show the uh, the investment in, in uh, maintenance and and why it is important. And I mean, it, again, it doesn't matter what you've got out there. You need to visit the transmitter site. Uh, how often will de be determined more by what's out there and the conditions, but it still needs to be part of the schedule. Jeff, uh, Bert here. Um, yeah. one, your comment about what's the first thing you look at at a transmitter site. When I walk in, the first thing I look at is the floor. Yeah, for the critters. <laughs> No, not so much for that is the junk and trash. Oh, yeah. Critters, and of I, course. I look for overall cleanliness. If it's dusty and dirty, you can bet that uh, things aren't getting cooled the way they should. Not just cooled, you can be reasonably sure if it's dusty. So I mentioned in a, a recent uh, interview about a site I walked into where I was convinced the engineer was trying to commit suicide. I mean, they had panels open on all the electrical panels. The covers were off them. Uh, the transmitter had half the interlocks bypassed. It's, you know, there was uh, Schedule 90 conduit pieces laying on the floor. It, it's like... I, I couldn't, I mean, I walked in, I looked and I said, yeah, no, I'm not doing a whole lot in here today. I, uh, nice to meet you. Let's go grab some lunch. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's uh, very much the, the pride in the facility will tend to show. And, and, and I'll quantify that because in some cases you got one engineer. I, I got one group where I know the engineer. I know he takes pride in his work. I also know he's one engineer covering 42 stations in 17 states. So there, there's a limit, you know, if you don't want to work 20 hours a day, sometimes things don't get done. I get that. When you get to a transmitter site, Jeff, do you read the maintenance log that's there? I tip, and again, remember, I'm not uh, approaching it from the viewpoint. If I was coming in and trying to troubleshoot a problem, I would. Um, if I'm coming in to do a due diligence or an inspection of the grounding or whatever, I'll usually skip that. I'll still take my thermostatic, re my uh, temperature sense of the reading of the breaker panel because I really do like to know that part of the thing. Um, but yeah, the maintenance log, what, I mean, what we use our log for is more to remind me what I did four trips ago when I think I did that software update, but I can't remember for sure. So that's, you know, again, like I said, as I get older, my memory gets shakier. And uh, that's the probably the closest thing to a diary I ever keep because I really suck at journaling. But, uh, but the transmitter log, we do, we do tend to at least give a, a basic outline of why we were there. Would you say that you see a lot of sites with no log at all? I would say probably more without one than with one these days. Yeah, I mean, it used to be when I was doing field service in the 90s, Every site had a had like a little duo tang or a notebook or a scribbler or 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 whatever, but these days, yeah, it's fifty fifty. Now, having said that, I mean the uh, transmitter log for our facility is an Evernote file shared on a OneDrive account, so it's electronic. There is no actual physical log book anymore. So yeah, I mean it, it varies, but uh, it, yeah, you don't see it as much as you used to. Hey, Jeff, I was often wondering this. When you run a uh, firmware update on, on an Autel transmitter, isn't there some sort of update log that uh, is recorded inside the transmitter that this update has uh, been applied or whatever? There is. And finally, after years of crying and whining and a little bit of pleading and some threatening, um, we've standardized so that the software version on the website bears some resemblance to the software version showing on the uh, software log when you go into the transmitter. On the older transmitters, you'll see a list. When you go to the software log, you'll see a list of hex and EEP files that uh, bear no resemblance. So you end up calling support to say, hey, what are these files? What version is this from? Or you have to download the latest package, unpack it, and then take a look to see what the files are. So. 
you know, that's one of those things as we get more into software, we're getting better too, because yeah, I mean, software develop transmitters. I mean, our V series was the first one we had and, and it's been a learning curve for sure. Hey, Jeff, um, this might be opening a can of worms, but what do you consider essential items to go on a transmitter line? Just that you open the door and say, hey, everything's okay, or more, more essential stuff? So, like I, and I, I it's, did an interview on this topic for an ebook a week or two ago, but uh, one of the things that I, uh, I say is I try whenever I go up the hill to have a purpose for this particular visit, my general purpose. Now, I will still do my temperature check. I'll do my filter check, look at the blower belts, things like that. I'll, I'll do that regardless. I'll do that every single time I walk in the door. Um, but I don't just say, okay, it's the first Monday of the month, I need to go to the transmitter, unless there is something on my schedule that says this is why I should be there. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, it's easy to just do it because you always do it without really looking to see, I guess, the why of it. I mean, like in the summertime, if you're in a rural area in, in farm country, you're probably going to visit the transmitter, especially if you've got forced air cooling, you're going to visit that transmitter a lot more often. Um, if you're down in Mississippi where, you know, the cotton season, July, August, you're probably going to visit uh, whether you're air conditioned or forced air because you're going to need to blow the cotton fibers out of the uh, heat exchangers or out of your air filters. So it, it really, really depends on where you are and the specific situation, but you need to figure that out and have a schedule. I mean, it, it's easy for me, me to tell you the things you need to check, you know, generators, backup systems, air filters, belts, uh, heat exchangers, coils, things like that. But I can't tell you how often you should check them. That's going to be specific to your site. I come across a thing more and more. We didn't always have connectivity at the tower sites and we've made friends with lots of sort of mom and pop wireless providers. Mm -hmm. And usually you, you can get some revenue, but at a lot of sites with some clients, they don't really want the money. They would just as soon have the bits. But the problem has become horizontal surfaces get used for the WISP equipment instead of racks. That's the first thing to check when you come in. I, I'm in West Texas, Eastern New Mexico, where a little bit of grit on the floor is perfectly acceptable because if I came in and vacuumed it up yesterday, in a week, you would know that, oh yeah, you, you don't have to go outside to know what state you're working in. But the wisps have become kind of an annoyance because it's like, guys, we'll buy you a rack. We'll give you a rack. Come up here one day and I will help you move everything off the workbench and the other horizontal surfaces into a rack, but we need to reclaim this space. Now, one of the cool options for that is go to Lowe's or Home Depot or Menards or, or wherever, depending on where you have to be, drop $20, $30 on a shelving unit, stick it in a corner, maybe drive a bolt into the wall to secure it and put a piece of paper on it that says reserve for WISP name here. And now they've got all the flat surfaces they could ever hope to use. Now that does assume, of course, that your transmitter site has got enough room in it to uh, accommodate a few more uh, shelving units. Because I've run into, so I ran into one, my best one at all was in Taiwan. Um, we took meter readings by grabbing a um, drill with a hex, uh, a, a nut driver on it and unscrewing the uh, corrugated tin on the side of the transmitter building because the transmitter was flush up to the wall of the building. Uh, you couldn't read the meters from inside the building. Um, of course, that's the same one on a mountaintop where I took the uh, flange off the coax and the transmitter tipped over because the coax was what was holding it vertical. So, uh, you know, I don't think I've seen anything quite like that in the U.S. yet, but I haven't seen them all, so I'm sure there's some. I saw a similar one in Taiwan. Might have been the same site. Was it running into a 16 bay with the top bay just below the tree level? No, this was a, uh, a, let's see, I think it was a, a six bay. 
Taiwan is interest, interesting for the folks that haven't been there. Um, and I don't know if it's changed in the past 10 years, but it used to be the maximum transmitter that you could have power level wise was a kilowatt. So they'd buy 20 kilowatt transmitters, ship them to Hong Kong or someplace that wasn't Taiwan, remove the serial number label and anything that identified what power level it was, slap on their own label saying that it was a one kilowatt transmitter, and then it would continue on the journey to Taiwan. It would get there and the inspector would open it up and see one kilowatt transmitter and he didn't know what he was looking at, so off it went. And uh, they'd have a, a like I say, a 16 bay antenna hidden under the tree line on top of a mountain, a real worm burner. And uh, so 20 kilowatts into 16 bays halfway of space is uh, going to generate a little bit of TPO, a lot more than a kilowatt for sure. But uh, that's how they get stuff done up there. Been there, seen that. I did work in Taiwan and uh, they had the the usual backup, but there was no there was no rule that said that you couldn't have them both on at the same time. So everybody had a combiner. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I mean that the same deal. It, it's like there are a lot of creative ways of getting around some of this stuff. So somebody post me in a direct message. If you're over 50, the first thing you do when you get to the transmitter site is find out where the bathroom is. And you can always tell the urban people from the rural people because, well, the bathroom is the 300 acres around the building. You know, <laughs> Which direction one you want to go depends on where the road is. And the wind, which way the wind's blowing. Never pee upwind. I actually carry a portable, one of those little camping toilets in my truck because some of my sites don't have that kind of bathroom. Yeah, yeah, a bumper dumper. There you go. That's uh, so for anybody who doesn't know it, a bumper dumper is a uh, toilet seat that plugs into the two inch receiver on your trailer hitch, and uh, you just hook a five gallon bucket with a plastic uh, bag line in it, and uh, you got yourself a full set of facilities. All you're missing is, I don't know, a room. Just hope but, uh, that nobody drives off while you're sitting there. <laughs> Someday that's going to happen on I-5. You can see it coming any day now. <laughs> and you can go to any camper or RV supply and they'll provide you with basically a full height black shower curtain and some little props and bathroom stall. So it and your bucket or it and your composting toilet and it bugged me a lot less when I was younger. The older I've gotten and the more diagnosable diseases you get treated for, you, you know, you'll, you'll take your midday meds and suddenly it's, yeah, I wish I had, you know, the bucket was a little closer. Yeah. <laughs> Going to say, I should have timed this just a little better. Yep. I uh, ended up at a uh, site in, uh, I think I was, it was Paraguay for that one. And, uh, I, uh, nature called after a, a giant uh, dinner with way too much uh, animal product in it. Is, there is such a thing. And uh, so I uh, decided that I was just going to sneak out back of the transmitter building. So I um, sort of hit it out and the, one of the guys grabs me and is, uh, where, where are you going? And I said, well, I could go out back and you, you said, El Bano. And he goes, oh, no. And I go, no, what do you mean, no? And he goes, oh, it's crocodiles. And I was like, okay, I don't speak a lot of Spanish, but I speak crocodiles. So uh, we ended up walking a mile down the road. Well, that, uh, you know, in my 20s, I could manage that walk. If I had to do it today, there'd be a problem. You also look up and see security cameras or station sky cams and things, and you realize, I, yeah, yeah, I'd like to be somewhere else right about now. What do you do if your site is right next to a golf course? You know, that, that's where you get David's uh, curtain, that's for sure. The little shower stall thing. <laughs> of course, golf courses usually have uh, facilities in the clubhouse. Now, the question is if they'll let you in, because most of the, a lot of them aren't public. Yeah, if you're at the back nine, there are a lot of remote, you know, rest buildings there. They're pretty rudimentary, but, you know, better than nothing. 
Well, and like I say, I mean, you can get a five gallon bucket from Lowe's or Home Depot for three bucks. You line it with a plastic garbage bag and get a toilet seat to rig for the top of it. And, you know, worst case scenario, you go in the transmitter building and bag it out with you. But yeah, that comes back to one of those uh, preparation things. If you know you're going to spend the day at a site with no facilities, and, you know, I've been at some sites in North Houston where you aren't going to be dropping trial out behind the transmitter building unless you wanted to get your butt shot off. We're basically shy critters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true enough. There, there's a limit to how much exposure I need in, uh, in my public life or private life. Of course, it used to be that uh, every decent station had a facility. So well, the, every every decent station had been staffed and had operators, and <laughs> we actually had a section of the rule that said if you're if you're going to have operators, you have to provide sanitary facilities. So I still encounter a few, but I, I would say that the ones with uh, water, even let alone toilet facilities, are probably by far the exception. I, I wouldn't even want to guess that it's in the single digit, or like five percent range. Well, and rural water is is its own set of problems. If it's if it's not mineral laden enough to clog your pipes, which is one problem, we're now in an age where you have to have permits to operate your well. And you have to go to whichever jurisdiction your tower is in. You know, you could be working outside of Dallas or Houston, but you're going to the city of Devers, Texas or Sour Lake, Texas mm -hmm. to talk to them about a permit for your well. And it has to get sampled and tested. Inspectors have to come out. And it just, it becomes harder and harder to keep things like that running on any level. Well, and I don't know what it runs here, but to put a well in, or, or don't know what it runs for y'all, but I mean, I put a well in this place, oh, three years ago now, and it was on the wrong side of $10,000 the time they drilled through 300 feet of granite to hit the water table. Uh, and so, if you're in, if you're in places like way out here in the Western half of Texas, where there is no water, you cannot just add a well, you have to get in line, there are waiting lists, and we're going to destroy the aquifer one day and discover, oh, you know, we don't know how to recharge this. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, definitely, although the facilities are nice, they're not always possible. So, yeah, having, oh, the other thing that I do, and, and it's really, I say cool, I don't know if cool's the right word for it, but one thing that COVID has made a lot more accessible is hand sanitizer or, you know, something to wipe up with or clean up with. I mean, I've always had something in my toolkit for, because you cannot crawl through a transmitter for five hours straight and come out as pristine as if you just came out of the shower. It just ain't going to happen. So, I remember a fellow that um, in his some little emergency kit kept a cell, fresh seltzer bottle. And mm -hmm. uh, I asked him what that was for. And he said, you'll find out. So what was it for? Or just cleaning up? It was his version of a portable bidet. Ah, there you go. Hey. Yep. Bird, he's too young to remember that seltzer bottles had a, had a, a carbonated spout instead of a, just a bottle opener. Yeah. See, seltzer yeah. is not a thing for me, but. Talking about the ones you could use to put out a fire. Right. Or Clarabelle would shoot a howdy doody. Right. Well, that's dating. <laughs> I actually, uh, yeah. Guilty. I actually was at the <laughs> filming of a of a howdy duty program back in the forties. Well, we've definitely moved the conversation from one duty to another. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you also get so, to these sites. You also get to these sites where you could get trapped. Uh, we're not far enough north that. Uh, that it could be snow, but you could be stuck for storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. Uh, at mountaintop villages, um, I suppose uphill from some of Berry sites or El Paso, Albuquerque, you can end up in places that you can't readily escape. There are a couple of sites at El Paso. The only access is you climb up the side of the hill with a pack or you take the cable car and I've been up there when they're on the two-way saying, oh, yeah, by the way, we just tore up a gearbox. Uh, you're going to be there a little while. Yeah. And the coldest I've ever been was working in a 
fiberglass transmitter building. And at, you know, at midnight, I turned off the last warm thing in that space, spent the night working on it. Uh, subsequently, we had a couple of sleeping bags and extra blankets that would hang from the overhead grid, uh, stuffed with energy bars and bottled water, most, mostly to keep the critters out of it because they could get into anything. Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. Uh, I <clears throat> have sites across Maine, and I had one fun night when they'd shut off the ski lift, and I had to snowshoe down the ski mountain <laughs> in the dark. Yeah, There's and I mean, that's... No and that's one of those things where, you know, I mean, it, it'll vary site to site. I was at a site in Fairbanks rebuilding a 10 kilowatt after a filter failure. And uh, they ended up bringing a, a salamander in to heat the room enough to make it tolerable because while at minus 40 degrees, they're like, it's a dry cold. And it's like, yeah, that's like saying Tucson's a dry heat. You know, my oven's a dry heat. It's still hot. So uh you, yeah, you, you definitely need to accommodate for the environment. Like for us, our site is about four miles off the main road on a sort of kind of maintained power line cut. By sort of kind of maintained, what I mean is when the site, when the snow gets to be more than two feet deep, they'll send a plow up it after the snow stops in a day or two. So if you're going up there, you check the forecast because the snow is forecast for that day. You don't go up there typically, you know, now we have the advantage if it's off the air, I can plug a 50 watt in on a short stick back at the uh, studio and, and cover our community. But, uh, you know, like I said, we don't have a lot of backups, but we do have an unofficial ox. So, uh, you know, if I had to make it official, I probably would. And uh, let's see, I'm talking to, I hope, I don't know how many Canadians are in the room. I hope nobody wrote that down. Anyway, yeah, it's uh, definitely, you know, you have to make accommodations. It's like I said to Brady earlier, you really got to make the accommodations and the uh, determinations based on your own specific facilities and situations. Uh, I've uh, snowshoed off of, uh, well, I haven't snowshoed off Lookoff Mountain, but I've snowshoed off one or two other sites over the years, and I have a customer who snowshoed down Lookoff, and I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, I was at the top of Mount Diablo in, in um, 39, 3945 feet above sea level, which is not much, but it's the biggest thing around, and the park ranger came up and said, we're closing the site in 10 minutes. You got 10 minutes to get down out of the gate because once we close the gate, you're up here forever. Yep, and uh, I mean, with us, the good thing about our site is that it's owned by the power company, the local power company. So uh, and one of their requirements is that we call their uh, main uh, facilities management number when we're going up and give them an idea how long we'll be and then call them again when we're going down. Yep. And they actually pay attention. If you call them when you're going up and tell them, yeah, I'll be about an hour. If you haven't called them back in an hour and 15 minutes, your phone's going to ring. And uh, that that's a really good thing. You know, the, it's a sense of security. If I go up there and the, the weather gets a little ugly while I'm up there and it's like, okay, I, I'm leaving now, but do you mind if I call you back in half an hour when I get down to the main road? And if you don't hear from me in half an hour, send a tow truck or something. That is terrific. So many places you don't have anyone like that. Uh, about two years ago, fellow down in San Angelo, hurt himself, bled out, died. And, uh, you know, that just no one knew. And yeah. it's, it is the saddest thing. And since then, I've been an awful lot better about filing flight plans. And you tell people, if you do not hear from me by this time, this is where I plan to be, but call me and here are, you know, here are the, reg the regular other numbers to call. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's rude to leave. Go ahead. Let's say that's one of the things that I've been beating the drum on more and more out of, I mean, I do a lot of safety presentations and talking about engineers found at site dead. And I mean, what a really fun line to Google. But uh, the funny thing is, and again, I use funny advisedly, more and more I'm discovering that very few of the guys that are dying at the transmitter site are dying because they stuck their fingers into something hot and got electrocuted. 
it's always, almost always, you had a heart attack, you had a stroke, you tripped on something and banged your head, like you were saying, David. Um, any one of a hundred things not related to actual electricity. So yeah, I mean, having somebody who knows where you are and knows roughly when you'll be back and some kind of call out system. If you can't get anybody to go with you, then, then do that at the very least. A yeah. friend of mine uh, who goes up to Mount Wilson a lot, but he'll take various routes because of where he comes from. He may come up from the desert side. He may come up from the LA side. There's, there's various routes you can get up there. And he was concerned. He's the same age as I am, 80. And he, uh, was concerned about, you know, what if something happens, you know? So uh, he and I both have a program called Life 360 in our phones. And I know where he's at, he knows where I'm at, even without, you know, I know when he's going up the mountain, I know when he's going out of town or something, and I can see him anywhere really in the world on this program. But um, it's been very handy uh, you know, the only thing you need to do is have cell phone coverage in an area. That's the only limiting thing. There are some problems with that uh, going up to Mount Wilson, but for the most part, I know where he is and I can... I can... Yeah, and I mean, beyond that, uh, like for me, I do a lot of uh, backwoods hiking with my dogs. I'm we go out, we typically go anywhere between five and 10 miles a day most days. And um, so I've got the uh, GPS tracker set up on my phone through my Map My Ride app. So my wife can log in and see exactly where I am and whether I'm moving. And whether I'm moving is more important than where I am. Because if I'm moving, it means I'm still alive, obviously. Um, and I know, I, I don't know if my Fitbit tracker has, but there are some watches, like smart watches, that actually have uh, health trackers on them, where if you stop moving or your heart rate or drops below a certain level, they will uh, do a ping to your cell phone to basically call you and say, are you okay? And if you don't respond, they can be configured to call 911 or emergency services number. So, I mean, that's another thing that might be if you're in an area where you end up or in a situation where you end up working in a lot of remote places alone, that might not be a bad idea to look into having something like that set up. What is, what is that called? You'd have to do some research because I don't know. I just know that uh, one of the smartwatches I was looking at when I bought this Fitbit offered the feature. And I want to say that it was the, uh, the Gar not the Garmin, the... Uh, Shoot, might have been the Garmin smartwatch. I forget which one. So you, you're going to have to spend some time with Google. I, I don't know enough to know. Is, is what hey, I'm Jeff. Saying. Yeah. The uh, the newer Apple watches, do you know, have the, I call it the, you know, I've fallen, I can't get up. And you can set that to either call 911 or somebody, a family member, whoever you want that's in your contact list. And if you, okay. if you have the watch with the cellular, it'll do it without the phone. You know, mine is mine has to have the phone nearby. Yeah, but you could you can get the watch with its own phone service and number and stuff. And if you have that one, it'll do it totally just just by having a watch with you. And so you just have to watch it when you're playing with the grandkids. You know, if you <laughs> up on the ground, it goes. It appears that you've fallen. Would you like me to call somebody? You know, no, no, no. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. That's but it does correct. ask you first. It asks you first, so I give credit for that you are pinned to the floor under four, three or four year olds. And that's, I, I, I always thought they're little, I can take them. And I've discovered I can't take three of anything and two four year olds or five year olds. If, if I'm pinned down, I am not getting up. I have an like 80 pound black lab. If he's excited, I'm not moving. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's pretty good. And I've, I've just found the watch. The other thing the, the Apple will do, at least, is you could also use it like a wrist phone, which is actually handy when you're working on stuff. <laughs> yep. yep. And I mean, a couple of my the, sites all go two hours without any kind of cell phone coverage. So I bought one of those, you know, five dollar a minute satellite phones, and I, I have it on just in case I need it because if I'm going to need it, I'm going to need it. Uh, yeah. It's, it's one of those ones you only pay for if you use. So. It gives me a sense of security and my wife a sense of security as well. 
Well, and you can add that to a station's disaster recovery plan. We used to have those at every Univision radio home office. Everyone had a minimum. Every, you know, the, every phone had like 15 minutes built into the plan, but it was like the earliest days of cell phones. And typically we would try to do like a conference call every quarter, just go to the roof, you know, go out the fire exit, and we're going to do a few minutes just so we got something for the minute, you know, for the dollars and to prove the thing actually worked. Right. And, and again, you, you, you try to get people in 20 offices across the country to do one thing. That's like herding cats. But yeah, that, yeah. That's the... except if you're working on a transmitter and you have a Fitbit on and your phone goes off and you're on vibrate and suddenly you, your Fitbit starts vibrating, you're thinking you're getting bit uh, by, by of something. Yeah, of course, if I work on a transmitter, if I have the doors off, I don't have rings or wristwatches or anything on. That's yeah. that's the first thing you need to do to put down. Except I forgot because, I, uh, you know, these Fitbits are rubber now, so you don't even think of it as being metal anymore. <laughs> yeah. It scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> there used to be a section, the rules, about good engineering practice, and inspectors used to use that to uh, ding you for any exposed RF in the transmitter room. That's so, Phil? I don't remember that one. <laughs> Uh-oh. When did again, the... How many people do you know walk around and say four beers? We when, had, did, uh... when did GEP go out of print? My whole career I've heard about it. But I've only seen excerpts of it. it. It was out of print, I think, in the 50s, wasn't it? Nope. I had a station inspection here. The, the, only, uh, the only formal one that I ever had in 78. And uh, the transmitter, I had just been hired by this company. Uh, it was a Collins 550A1. And the fan had died. So the back of the transmitter was removed and the air conditioner funneled right into the transmitter inside a locked building, inside a locked gate. And the inspector dinged the station for good engineering practice. Where, where was this, Mary? Tucson. Huh. This, yeah. this goes to another story about the guy. FM or AM? AM. Told me he was gonna he was gonna have to write us up because we didn't have all the contracts on our part time person air per, air people, and oh, those uh, situations. there was. Uh, then he told me that we were over overpowered nine hundred and fifty four millivolts uh, at at a mile on a five hundred watt transmitter, uh, and then he told me there was a radial exposed, <laughs> a radial. Wow. Radio You'd have a lot of fun out here because the 50 kilowatt locally is, uh, the, the site was on uh, bedrock and all the radials were exposed. Yeah, you do have to. Well, yeah, there was a I, site above Santa Barbara where it was never covered. They tried all kinds of things with rock. They tried it with tar, mm -hmm. little blobs of cement. There's one north of the Phoenix. The 1100 was entirely over a, a, a tight rock bed and there were little dabs of concrete every few feet trying to hold it down if someone if an inspector asked me about an exposed radial i'd say not my part of the job you need to go in back and talk to the copper thief who's working the array right now <laughs> bird what was that 1500 up on the hill over burbank uh the once uh, kroq kbbq yeah That was on top of rock, wasn't it? You do what you have to. Yeah, they actually had sprinklers to try and keep it damp. And read a description of it once. They had the quarter wave radials and had put a like a racetrack of copper around that and run copper weld from the, the perimeter ground as far over the sides as they could throw it. Still didn't talk well, but they were trying to make it settle down. The flip side of that, of course, is uh, when the foliage overtakes the inside of your tower fence and you can't see the tower from the foliage. 
the other flip side before. was a station I visited in the Seychelles where the towers were about a quarter mile offshore, offshore on top of a barrier reef. No radials needed. <laughs> That'd be nice. Just drop one copper lead down there and you're done. Pretty much. All right. Well, on that note, I have got to leave. It's near the top of the hour. My real boss has a birthday today, and I promised her dinner at her favorite fish and chips dive. So I'm going to go out and load up on grease and cholesterol. Ah, very good. Sounds like, sounds like a good time. <laughs> and I'm correction, uh, Jeff, the first thing any engineer finds near a transmitter site is where to eat. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and that's the cool thing about visiting y'all is uh, everybody knows the good places to eat, which is why I have a subscription to Noom these days and spend five to 10 miles a day with on the trails with the dogs. But on that note, I will let y'all go. And uh, thanks very much for the day and uh, hope to see some of you. We're starting the Tuesday sessions again next week. Uh, talking about Jim Gray's going to come in we're going to talk about drone inspections and technology in general and uh, how uh, how annoying all this stuff is when the process of trying to make our lives easier Did you see that drone that went into the lava flow yesterday or the day before what a I did, great I did not but I'm going to be googling that because that'll probably be uh, featured in the slide deck <laughs> well Jeff thank you we appreciate your being uh, with us uh, each month and uh, talking about all these things and we appreciate the uh, wealth of experience here because of the many different sites that you've had a chance to visit. I just, I'd like it because we can talk to all kinds of folks that, uh, I mean, it's like I said, for anything we run into, there's somebody that knows more than me. I just happen to be the guy that they put in front of the microphone the most. But, Take care, Jeff. Uh, Be well. On that note, thanks, all. Have Work a good day. Work safely, Jeff. Everybody. See you. Take care, Jeff. Go Have a good you. one, Jeff. <laughs>